to be here interviewing uh, Josh Fadham. Uh, and uh, tell us a little bit uh, about yourself, because one of the things that we have been talking about earlier is Mel Brooks and his Jewish sensibilities and the Jewish sense of being an outsider. And Mel Brooks consistently conveys that. And he's an outsider who comes from New York. Josh, you're from Tulsa. How far outside are you? Well, I mean, there is a Jewish community here in Tulsa, and um, you have a million. <laughs> there's uh yes, that's where that's uh I had a bar mitzvah at least, um, and I uh, had a confirmation, and I had Sunday school and Hebrew school, and went to services, and we have seder's and uh, all the things that Jews do. Reform Jews do. Uh, there's a temple and a synagogue, but and I actually was fortunate enough to go to, um, you know, elementary school, middle school, high school, all very mixed, diverse schools, magnet schools. But despite that, I did still always have kind of a uh, a, a sense of uh, you are other, you know, um, and I think that's just kind of a. a uh, the Jewish, the Jewish way. But anyway, I did that. I experienced that growing up. No, like, uh, extreme aggressive antisemitism, but, um, the you know, feel Southern kind. Yeah. Or maybe, maybe a nice sort of like curious Southwest kind. Um, uh, and, uh, um, you know, it's, and so, yes. So I, I, at age 20, I um, moved to Los Angeles and then started doing comedy. And I went to the Groundlings. I went to UCB. I went through those comedy theater programs. I did stand up. And then that sort of made its way into having a comedic character actor career. Well, that that's a success story, which has brought you to Hollywood or today back to Tulsa. Mm hmm. I kind of bounce between, That's but mostly that, Tulsa. It, it, it's kind of a Freudian question that belongs uh, in history of the world part two. But you relate your humor and your sense of humor to your sense of Judaism, or are they just not separable? Um, it's hard to answer that. Uh, I, I mean, an easy answer, I guess, would be like, yes, you know, um, and it is a easy thing to suddenly be like or to say, by the way, I'm Jewish. And then that just gives a quick uh, context for. So I'm Jewish. So everything else you're about to see, you're going to know you should know this is coming from a Jew or you should know I have some sort of Jewish lived experience that maybe you uh, intellectually are going to associate me with or you maybe have no idea, you know. Um, so uh, when you out yourself as a Jew, is anyone surprised? Su surprisingly, sometimes people are surprised. Really? You know, sometimes, okay. I've, you know, I've gotten that before. Uh, I mean, it's funny. Nick Kroll uh, said the other day about one of the bits I did on the um, History of the World show. He said, I was trying to think of who could I cast for this one bit that was more Jewish than me, um, which, you know, kind of transitions even to the uh, the subject of, um, you know, making fun of oneself for being extra Jewish. Uh, but also there's it's in some ways a compliment. But rewinding to what your question was about, do people, you know, how do I relate to it? I mean, it's. Um, 
it's just always kind of there, you know, and I grew up watching tons of Jewish humor, Mel Brooks constantly, you know, at, um, Marx Brothers, et cetera. And I think, um, I think that, uh, you know, when you're a kid, I don't know how it's what it's like for people on the coast who grew up around a lot of Jews. But if you're a kid and you're getting told like, hey, how come you don't celebrate Christmas? And how come you're what you're Jewish? What's Jewish? You know, and and uh, stuff like that. Um, uh, things that are comedic or funny or Jewish are you're going to connect with, you know, um, but I, I, I find myself connecting with or I found myself as a kid connecting with anything Jewish, you know, like when Eddie Murphy played the old Jewish man in coming to America, that was like the coolest to me. Well, that's a great segue because to the question that gets asked until this series, uh, History of the World Part Two, was could Mel Brooks make the movies he made in the past that pushed the bounds of tastefulness or tastelessness of ethnic stereotyping today? And when you talk about that wonderful scene where uh, Eddie uh, Murphy is actually dressed in Jew face mm -hmm. and why an African-American can wear Jew face and a Jew can't wear blackface, which I absolutely get. It is an interesting irony that much of the world does not understand. Yeah, I think that and I can't speak for all Jews. I personally <laughs> think for me, it's a different context. So we all know that there's a context of and a meaning of what blackface, a history of what blackface right. is. And today we look at that in any form is inappropriate. Um, and I think, you know, they that word gets adopted black face, brown face, Asian face, you know, or Jew face or whatever. Um, but I think that they're all different and have different meanings. I um, feel about other people playing Jews. Um, if they do it respectfully or they do it right or they get us right, I'm like, way to go. You got us right. And I personally feel like you know, there isn't there isn't or shouldn't be there's not an erasure to Judaism when when Jewish humor or or Yiddish words or cultures or whatever gets, um, quote unquote, co-opted in culture. I like to think of it like, yes, this is our contribution. We you know, and and if if Eddie Murphy does it right and. Uh, oh, cool. He likes us. He gets us. He, you know, or like when I was a kid and Robin Williams would be doing home oh, oh, and then suddenly he snaps into a rabbi character or whatever. You know, I thought he's not Jewish, but I always thought, oh, he knows us. You know what I mean? That was always how I viewed. I never viewed it like, are they making fun of us or do they hate us? Or I never viewed it like that. I still yeah, don't. The, the whole issue that gets talked about today about cultural uh, misappropriation confuses appropriation with misappropriation. If you're punching down to demean the other person or doing a bad job, it's one thing. If you're being informed, if you are informing, if you're doing a good job of portraying something real, uh, all culture is appropriation. Yeah, that's what we borrow. We we uh, we make a a gemichter salat out of uh, out of all of these things. Uh, so Mel answered the question, could this movie be made today? And uh -huh. it was made. I've only seen four episodes, which is uh, two nights. There are another two nights to come. And one of the things that struck me, the first thing, of course, being older, much older than when I first saw it was, gee, there's a lot of vulgarity. Gee, there's a lot of stuff that I don't remember. And then I realized I do remember. I do remember falling out of my seat in Blazing Saddles in the farting scene because yeah. he took the logic of cowboys eating beans around the campfire and took it to its natural but unsayable up until then uh, conclusion. And as I watched this, there was, of course, he's pushing the envelope and the current writers are pushing the envelope. And but there's a seriousness of purpose. 
there are truths, there are gags, there are songs. There are parts that you laugh out loud and parts where you go, I can't believe that he did that. And that's part of the joy of the Mel Brooks style, I think. Yeah. Um, in It's funny. I remember when I was a kid and my parents, my mom showed me Blazing Saddles. I remember her uh, saying, this is the first movie to feature farts. This is the first farting movie. Which, you know, I was like, whoa, I'm watching history as well. But um, you're uh, hearing history. Actually. I'm hearing history. The same way that Archie Bunker flushing the toilet in All in the Family was an historic moment on television. Right. People have body functions. Who knew? Um, though I do remember, I, I wish I'd written it down. At some point I saw a movie that featured a fart. And I was like, I think this is from the 60s. I think that Mel Brooks is just pushing a narrative, which may not be true. Um, someone got to farts before him. Oh, no. Um, I don't know who or what it was. I'll let you know if I figure it out. But uh, I guess until I do, we'll just say Mel Brooks did it first. Um, you To rewind about the part of the question where could it be made today, I feel like that conversation gets had a lot and people say definitively, no, today it could not be made. And I I guess I like to take a contrary perspective and say, well, if you presented it with the right context, if you if you found a way to make something and address the fears that an audience today has of like, are you going to hurt me? Are, is it going to are you going to mean this? Is, is this going to be am, am I going to be? You know, how am I going to be taking this in? I just think that it's all about a lot of times comedy is about how you address it. You know what I mean? How how do you set something up so someone can take in the punchline or. Yeah, I don't know. I try to take well, an it's opportunity. A question Otherwise, that, that answered itself because it was made today. And it oh, was history of the world. You mean? Yeah. History of the world. Part two. Uh, yeah. And if you watch part one and part part two together, you'll see some differences in style. But I don't think there's a difference in the uh, sword that the humor uh, wields, sometimes with glancing blows and sometimes, uh, well, we don't want to give away what happens at Rasputin's bris, but sometimes mm -hmm. the sword is used uh, dramatically. For yes. a full phylectomy, but you can look that up later. The uh, yeah, the the issues of taste I find uh, real really interesting. Years ago, when I was teaching a course called "A Hundred Years of Jewish Humor," uh, and this was about twenty eight years ago, I showed adult students the entire film of the producers, not the musical, the original one, "Springtime for Hitler." They were horrified. A third of them walked out and a third of them remained to beat me up while the other third just went stunned. I showed it again 20 years later and it was like, so it's a funny movie. Yeah. And it became funny over time. So I guess that comedic cliche that comedy is tragedy plus time uh, has some truth to it. But so the original producers was a hit when it came out. And then was it just between the time that it came out and the time that you showed it, they had forgotten about it or they didn't know about it or they were like, oh, how dare they make light of this? Or well, it's what do you think it was? They didn't. That, like that, that's, an, that's an interesting question because I don't know who saw it, what audience saw it. I, I guess I assume they were mixed, but I think you raise a really important question. And maybe to the question of Jewish humor. Uh, is there a Jewish humor? To me, the funniest Jewish humor that I've heard in years have been from non-Jews. When I saw Bend It Like Beckham in Encino, and when you see a movie in Encino, you can pretty well figure out that no Gentiles are going to be harmed in that audience. Mm -hmm. And in Bend It Like Beckham, it's the story of a girl who wants to play soccer from an or pretty orthodox uh, Hindu Indian background. And she sneaks out when she's supposed to be making uh, dinner 
with her bubby. I don't think she called her her bubby, but that was it. And when her mother finds out, her mother goes, oh, what did I do in a past life to deserve this? Every Jew recognized that joke. And the theater roared. Uh, and I think that's kind of the quintessential Jewish attitude of insight, irony, uh, family, a sense of connection to each other. Uh, I, I just love that as a Jewish joke. Uh, the other one was the one that uh, Woody Allen borrowed from Dick Gregory, who said, we sat in at a lunch counter for three years, waiting for them to integrate. And when they finally integrated, they didn't have what we wanted, which Woody Allen repurposed in Love and Death. But there's this sense of irony and handling the pain of life with the what I'll call the jujitsu of humor, mm -hmm. turning it, turning the pain around, not denying it, but turning it around and owning it. Um, a lot of uh, yeah, I guess a lot of humor and Jewish humor that I understood it as uh, growing up was like, you know, about being the outsider or being the outcast or being the disruptor or being different. You know, I mean, that's what I, I take from a lot of Marx Brothers stuff. They're all disruptors in their way. But I'm sure I took that idea and always was kind of looking in on even myself because, you know, growing up, I wasn't particularly religious. I didn't I knew I was Jewish and couldn't avoid that I was Jewish. And I loved my family of old Jewish grandparents and things. But uh, I remember going on an Israel trip being like, I don't want to be here. I don't want to do this. And um, and when I started um, doing stand up in my early 20s, I used to do this bit that went well, but it was kind of based off my dad emailing me when he knew I was doing stand up and he was like, you know, with his Oki accent, I interpreted it. He said, hey, Josh, you should do more Jewish humor. Everybody loves Jewish humor. Everybody from Larry David to John Stewart does Jewish humor. And I was like, oh, everyone from Larry David to John Stewart does Jewish humor. <laughs> but um, well, that's but a I, but, spectrum. Yeah. Wow. So many. <laughs> but I but I did a I it made me do a bit that was basically like uh, a um, an amalgam of Jewish cliches with a very Jewishy, you know, I would I would say, so this is for my dad. I say, I'm Jewish. I worry my therapist, I need therapy. Oy vey, I th I'm schmitzing with schmutz and my matzah and the latkes. That, you know, and I would just kind of cycle through every kind of Jewish humor cliche I could and manically spew it all out. And it would always go pretty well and people would like it and it would be a very high energy bit. And I remember I did it at, uh, the, the time that it didn't go well actually was for at what was the what's the very Jewish universities at Brandeis? Brandeis, yeah, yes. Well, we like to consider American Jewish University, but go now, Brandeis. Well, I think American Jewish University would have loved the bit. I performed it to a, a room full of kids at Brandeis and it was dead silence. They they did not, you know, and they were all a few years younger than me. And I felt like, hmm, this is uh, either and I didn't go to college. So I understand people are like taking a lot in that time and and uh, getting educated. And and there's probably was a lot of Jewish pride going on there because, hey, we're around Jews and we're getting educated about Jews and we're celebrating our Judaism. And I felt like this was my way of celebrating my Judaism by being meta or something like that. I don't know. I'm not going to defend it. <laughs> but anyway, it bombed hard. And I remember thinking like, ooh. Do they know I'm Jewish? Do they know like I I'm Jewish guys? It, I'm, it I'm making, didn't help. They did not like it. At no, Brand but, but American the, Jewish University, you guys would have ate it up. Come on. Oh, absolutely. Oh, you guys would have loved it. Yeah, I there there's uh, they're just wonderful stories. Myron Cohen told a story. He used to be an accent many, many years ago. He did a lot of uh, ethnic accents, every kind. But of course, being named Myron Cohen. And doing the cat skills, he was Jewish. And he tells the story or told the story about one day he's doing his act. And he says, two Jews get off a streetcar in Miami. A guy in the back of the auditorium says, pardon me, Mr. Cohen. Why must it always be two Jews? You couldn't pick on somebody else sometime. And Cohen says, OK, 
Two Chinese guys get off a streetcar in Miami, and Lung Pao says to Kun Wah, so what are you doing for Pesach? <laughs> Sometimes the ethnicity just is part of the story. You know, I, when I was thinking about this interview and meeting you and the and my reaction to the movie and to Mel Brooks, and we'll get to Mel Brooks and, uh, and directly, I thought first, you know, Mel Brooks is not Noel Coward. He does not write high-class British repartee. And then it occurred to me that Mel Brooks is Noel Coward. Noel Coward wrote about his class, the people that he knew, the people that he wanted to know, and he satirized them and caricatured them just as Mel Brooks knows what he is drawing, what he is stuffing and overstuffing. He knows his culture well enough to be able to find truth in the satire and not simply have it be shocking or dirty. Um, you reminded me of w one of the things that uh, one of the scenes when I was a kid that I loved the most in High Anxiety is the scene where they sneak through security by he and Madeline Kahn sneak through security by being extra Jewish, you know, by upping the Jew Jewishness to like 10,000, you know, Oy vey, I beeped, I beeped, take me away, you know, and then they're eventually just like, get him out of there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, as you say that, I just thought of that scene because that is a very, you know, self-aware Jewish, you know, uh, I don't know. You are it's caricature, yeah, but a making good the caricature, caricature is not a scribble. It's based on truth. Yeah. And yeah. and he does it. One of my I, I started laughing at at History of the World Part Two, right at the beginning, even before Mel Brooks comes on and is transformed uh, through the magic of uh, CGI and and other sorts of things into a into a hunk when it says for mature audiences only. And I'm trying to think in what universe do mature audiences seek out Mel Brooks? Yeah. So he already had me at the introduction, which I'm sure uh, was uh, not on purpose. Uh, what was it like for you to be able to work on, on this particular film? Um, I... I it was a thrill, of course, um, you know, Mel Brooks has always been a comedy hero. And um, I, you know, having done comedy and been in the same comedy circles as Nick Kroll, um, who was the executive, one of the executive producers, uh, you know, and Ike Barinholtz. And um, I, I never had interactions with Wanda Sykes, but always been a fan. The three they're kind of the three that have the, that sort of the taking the torch and putting themselves at the forefront of the sketches. Um, uh, I, you know, I knew, I knew them and I just got a call and then they, they said, you know, or I got an email from my uh, agent and was like, you know, I want to do this, this bit. And I was like, for sure. And then I did it. And then I had a blast. I really went for it. Um, of course, in that vomit sketch, the D-Day sketch, you know, spoiler alert, there's a vomit sketch. Um, I just remember it was also during COVID, you know, when we, everyone was still wearing masks and it was very, you know, it was a little more strict, you know, it's eased up more now. I mean, you still have to wear masks on set, but I just was thinking, you know what? I haven't, because of the pandemic, I have not had the opportunity to work that much. I'm going for it. And I just, they shot all kinds of stuff and then they just cut it to the, to the sketch that it was, but I just sprayed vomit everywhere you know and they gave little cups of vomit or whatever and i just thought you gotta go 100 percent. it's a mel brooks thing you gotta you gotta commit go, to the bed you gotta hit the ceiling and then um they called me back to do another bit which was also a similar thing it was a blast and it was very fun and another kind of commit to the bit thing which i think will be you know there were small bits but i was happy to do anything you know i was happy to even just do one so that i got to do two bits um, was a blast. Mel, uh, you know, being in his mid to late nineties was not on set, but I know that he was, 
you know, he oversaw a lot of stuff over Zoom. He contributed a lot. They sent him everything. He read everything. And uh, I heard Nick saying, you know, that he's, you know, was very encouraging. It was like, I love it. I love all the bits. I love all the dirty stuff. Like, you got to keep the dirty stuff. Keep, you know, and um, so I didn't have any interactions with uh, him personally on set. But I do have a few, you know, um, some inconsequential Mel Brooks interactions. I used to, well, uh, one time, you know, I think an uh, an agent of mine at a restaurant introduced me to him. This is my client. And he's, oh, how you doing? And that was that was nothing special. But I remember he used to come into the video store that I worked at. I worked at a video store for 10 years in L.A. called Cinephile by the New Art. And uh, he used to come in there and rent movies and class act. A lot of times, if it was a rare VHS or something, he'd just buy it out of the inventory for whatever the cost was. And then, you know. He'd bring it back and he'd say, here you go. You know, he'd pay full price instead of just signing it for an account. I thought that was nice and classy to support the store like that. And then another time during. Um, so I was doing a, a comedy show, a Christmas comedy show one year uh, or a Jewishy Christmas comedy show one year. And for part of the show, I made it like a super cut edit of um, as is about five minutes long of as many clips from TV, movies, music, pop culture that I could find of Jews saying Merry Christmas or doing some sort of it's Christmas. Come on. You know, like I think I squeeze Walter Matthau in there, Jason Alexander, Kevin Pollack, Gene Wilder, uh, Bette Midler, Bob Dylan, Barry Manilow, uh, uh, Jackie Mason is in there. You know, there's just there is quite a, a large amount of material to cut together of Jews, you know, pushing Christmas material. But when I was putting it together and trying to figure out how do I figure out all this Jewish stuff, I knew that Mel Brooks, because he had called in advance, was coming into the store. So I kind of put myself at the front. And when I came in and I was checking him out, I said, Mr. Brooks, do you mind if I ask you a question? He said, what? And I said, uh, I'm making a comedy video for a show of Jews saying Merry Christmas. Can you think of any clips or from movies or TV of Jews saying Merry Christmas? And he was so weirded out by it. He was like, what? What does that mean? You know, Jews saying Merry Christmas is like, that's a bizarre question. I never I never heard that question before. That's a very bizarre question. And I uh, and I was like, mm, I mean, do you know anything? And he was like, mm, how about the odd couple? I said, no, there's no one saying Merry Christmas in the odd couple. Hmm. I don't know. That's a very bizarre question. And then that was pretty much it. He never used it. Well, it wasn't for him. It was for a right. show of my own. I just asked him if he knew anything because I was like, well, he maybe knows movies. Maybe he'll think of something as like, yeah, in fact, my friend so and so Carl Reiner had a Christmas bit or something like that. But you know, one of my one of my favorite things about the movie is when I think about Mel Brooks, I do think farce, which comes from the word stuffed and overstuffed. Uh, but there's subtle stuff. There were subtle stuff uh, in in the in the series I, and during one of the Russian Revolution scenes. And the, the sequencing of this is very different from what people are used to. And just watch it and you'll get it. Uh, but during one of those scenes where the serfs are running around, you see a surfboard, S-E-R-F written on it, surfboard. So there are visual puns. Sometimes he had to explain them, obviously. Uh, but there's subtle stuff in there. And one of the things that I was doing as I was watching this, and here, having raised Noel Coward, I'm going to take Noel Coward and raise it to T.S. Eliot a famous anti-Semite, but mm. T.S. Eliot, you, you read The Wasteland and you are looking for homages and references to other literature and poems and just arcane stuff. That's part of the fun is dealing with the puzzle. Yeah. And one of the things that happens throughout the eight, well, the four shows that I've seen is re uh, the references to TV shows, to movies, to lines. You can sit there and just see it a second, a third, a fourth time to pick the, out 
the provenance of some of the lines, some of the characters, some of the gags. They absolutely nail the 70s sitcom when they're doing Shirley Chisholm. Yeah. Doing the Jefferson. And they get um, Marla Gibbs on there, too. And she's and she's wonderful. And they nail in several episodes uh, Fiddler on the Roof, including including the music. Uh, and the idea, just the concept of somebody coming up with the lone, theoretically lone survivor of the slaughter of the Tsar's uh, family, Anastasia, uh, Anastasia, becoming an influencer is just a wonderful and wild concept that you're looking at it, at, at the anachronisms that that the Mel, Mel Brooks and his style uh, create and you sit there and you like, how did they think of this? Yeah, I I also noticed that a lot of the show um, circles back to a very like comedy comedy process and like kind of Hollywoody process thing, like uh, portraying how so many things are done by committee, you know, and like with writers rooms, like Shakespeare had a writers room and he was a, you know, this belligerent showrunner type character um, or. And it wasn't know. too inside baseball, at least for we elite on the coasts mm-hmm. absolutely got the writers room and the pitches. Totally. Cause everyone understands focus groups and things like that. And that, and that like, Pretty much anything you see has gone through a series of filters to most of the time water it down to being crappy or stupid or palatable, you know, um, or simplistic. And I think it's funny to look at history and and big decisions that are made through that lens. And it's also a fun inside baseball comedy thing, you know, because comedians have all been like you're in because you get it. Yeah, Uh, absolutely. I I love the line. Uh, and it's not a spoiler because it's going to have a lot of funny lines. But I love the reflection of, you know, a shtetl's no place for a Jew. And I'm, yeah. I'm, I was smiling for forty five seconds on that. Um, wow. The uh, the sketch, the 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 uh, band, the uh, World War Two D Day sketch I was in. I I know they were sort of trying to emulate a like a band of brothers or Saving Private Ryan type look. You know, those early those opening scenes on the U-boat and stuff like that. But but it, it, it in some ways, in some ways, we're going to get to the viewers' questions and comments in a moment. In some ways, it's an homage going back full circle to the farting scene, because mm-hmm. the farting scene is the natural reaction of cowboys sitting around eating beans. Right. The vomiting scene is a natural reaction. I'm about to jump uh, out of an airplane. I've yeah. got a parachute. Maybe it works. Maybe it doesn't work. I'm going to be jumping into air where people are shooting and trying to kill me. It might be that my tummy is a little upset. Yeah. And maybe it was the oysters. Maybe it was the foie gras. Or maybe it's we're jumping out of an airplane. Maybe it's the bulimia. <laughs> maybe it's the bulimia. That was my and, character. But it, but it seemed to me to be, in a lot of ways, completely natural. And just so that the viewers aren't turned off this is this is not pea soup it is not that much in your face it's liquid but it's not horrifying but you are going am i really seeing this all right let's get to some of the questions well first of all the most important thing that we can do here today is there's information up um, and you can look up uh, uh josh hire him he's good He's I'm funny. Good. I'm a professional character actor. I'm a professional He's, Jewish character actor. I play all kinds of roles. Could you do an Italian? People thought have thought I could could do Italian. You know what? I just remembered you were saying something, and we were talking about uh, actors pulling off Jews and being like, okay, the you know the uh, the the now late actor Tom Sizemore who just passed, who has his own checkered past. Uh, I worked with him on uh, the show Twin Peaks, directed by David Lynch who directed The Elephant Man, produced by Mel Brooks, circling it all back. Uh, and um, and I, I was in a scene with him and he was saying, you know, what, who are you? What are you? Are you Italian? What, what, what are you? And I said, I'm Jewish. And he goes, you're Jewish? Really? You're Jewish? And and uh, he snapped into this like rabbinical character and started saying like a prayer. And I was like, 
I knew that he wasn't Jewish. I said, how did you? And he did it really well. And I was like, how did you? They said, oh, I did fiddle on the roof when I was in college. So I was impressed. Okay. So we have a question here. Uh, Joel Moss asks, are there any topics you feel should not be touched by comedy? There might be topics that I wouldn't, that I don't touch because I just don't, I'm not an authority on them or I don't have the hot take, but I generally feel if you can make it funny, do it. But sometimes it's just not going to be funny or you might not find the right take to make it funny. That's my general feeling. You know, it's like things that don't age. Well, it's because they came out during a specific time where it was a comment or reaction to something going on, you know, and then for people who saw it then and liked it, then a lot of times it ages well because they remember that time clearly. And then maybe people who come in and they they weren't around at that time. So they don't know that it's a conversation with the, the era. They aren't going to know exactly what was funny about it. And then other things are more timeless and they they just are always funny. You know, I guess it's case by case, really. Well, yeah, my wife and I both saw the uh, Benini Life is Beautiful. Mm -hmm. And the question was too soon to be making a quasi comedy that takes place uh, in a death camp. And I guess this is now 30 years uh, after the quasi comedy sitcom that took place in a stalag, but that's okay. But we had completely different reactions. My wife is the child of Holocaust survivors who was born in a DP camp in Germany uh, and I led an early life of comedy, and I'm watching the reality of the humor, that in the beginning, his humor is easy and relaxed. As the objective circumstances close in, his humor gets tighter and more frantic and frenetic and changes, and it seemed to me that that revealed an, a truth that was much more important than the laughter that I was able to see but she wasn't, and I completely understand why. Right. Uh, so it's part, what's the topic? How much time has passed? And what's the history of the person who's viewing it? Yeah, uh, how does it affect you? By the way, I remember seeing that and loving it. I was 19, it came out in 19, or 18, it came out in 1998, I think. And then uh, years passed and I thought, oh, that movie's no good and I don't like it and it's hacky. And then I think I rewatched it about 10 years ago and I was like, I love it. It's beautiful. I cried. So things always change. And sometimes you think it's great. It's bad. It's great again. You know, absolutely. Uh, Stephen, uh, maybe a Weiss, maybe Weiss uh, asked, do you recommend reviewing History of the World Part One before seeing Part Two? Or can you just get to Part Two and enjoy it? I think you could get to part two and enjoy it. Uh, there might be, if you watch History of the World Part One, you might, there might be some jokes in part two that are going to be slightly richer or have more context or even, I think, you know, it's going to be funny on its own, but uh, um, familiarize yourself with all of Mel Brooks's stuff. There's little things like there's a, there's a scene in the sketch with, uh, about the Civil War with, um, with Ulysses Grant and Abraham Lincoln, I know they have a quick moment where they go mm, like to each other. And, and I thought Blazing Saddles, you know, where they where Harvey Corman and Mel Brooks, they go. Mm, and I was like, that's probably a reference to that. But, you know, you either think it's funny when they go mm, or you don't or you catch it and you go, oh, I bet that's a Mel Brooks reference because it feels very Mel Brooksy. Uh, Jonathan Finkelstein uh, posits, could the first theatrical fart we, we we have reached our level here, obviously. OK, the first theatrical fart could have been in a John Waters production. Could have been. Could have been. Could I'm have trying been. to think that John, if John Waters predates Blazing Saddles, what year did Pink Flamingo? Well, he was making movies before Pink Flamingos. What year did Multiple Maniacs come out? Was it in the was it before Blazing Saddles or after? Don't know. Don't know. We're going to figure it out, though, and we're going to get back to Jonathan. Uh, Maurice asks, will there be a DVD release uh, of, I'm assuming, not our conversation, but History of the World Part Two? And I suspect the answer to that uh, will be you're so old that you're still talking about DVDs. Yeah, like DVDs are uh, way of the dodo, baby. Yeah. That's that, that's going to be on the next History yeah, of the I, World. I think they're going to be some tablets in cuneiform. Uh, but I suspect this will be continue to have a life of streaming. 
Right. Uh, maybe Blu-ray. Maybe they'll give it a Blu-ray. We'll see. Uh, do you think the comedy uh, Anonymous asks, Anonymous is always getting us into trouble. Do you think the comedy can lead to social change? Show an uncomfortable truth. Yeah, I guess so. But who the hell am I to give that definitive, important answer? I, I think, well, I'll, gi I'll give it then. I yeah, think the it. comedy seldom causes great social change, but I think it can cause individual change and that you get an epiphany and say, oh, my, oh, my, I do that or I learn something. Comedy is subversive because instead of making an argument, which you're already m making up your rejoinder, it pierces your defenses and you laugh. Going back to the farting scene. Um, my view of that is that no male ever outgrows junior high school humor. And you learn that because you laugh at that damn farting scene. Mm -hmm. And whatever you believe, what, however proper and tasteful you lead your life, uh, you are still laughing at something that got past uh, the defenses. Why didn't Mel Brooks make part two earlier? And uh, why were the scenes in part two not edited in somewhat chronological order? That I don't know. That's a filmmaker question. I was just a hired actor, but my guess is just for pacing and to keep it like a sketch, you know, and and why he didn't make it sooner. I don't know. That's probably there has something to do with financial or ideas or mm, how well the first one did or don't know. But I bet you Mel Brooks answered it somewhere. Uh I, at first, I have the same. We all have the same question waiting for part two to come out. But in terms of the way that this is cut together, it avoids some of the Saturday Night Live problems where they don't know how to end a sketch. Right. They can end a sketch anywhere they want to, but that doesn't end the subject. Three sketches later, the subject gets picked up again and it becomes a recurring theme. So they can get out of trouble on a punchline. And I th I thought thought that was really pretty brilliant structuring. I want to thank you, Josh, for being part of this. I want to thank the audience for remaining with us and want you to look up Josh and hire the man. He can even do Italian. Forgot and to forgot to mention that I have a distant cousin who passed away who was in History of the World Part One. Zael Kessler was his name. You can look him up. I didn't know him. I never met him. But you are trivia. a legacy. Thank you so much for being with us. It and was a pleasure. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.